In this video, I will provide you with a method you can use to lower the height of your riser when dealing with a stairway with a flat landing and keeping the same depth for each one of the steps. Now this will require you to rebuild the stairway. However, it will also allow you to work within the same space of the existing stairway. And feel free to check out the measurements. The measurements for both stairs will be exactly the same. And I went ahead and made the measurements about what they would be in some of the older homes that you might be dealing with, where you might have a riser height about eight inches and a tread depth of about nine inches. This seems to be a pretty common measurement for older stairs in tight spaces. And these will usually be stairways in smaller homes. So to fix this problem, you will be removing and replacing the stairway. And this is usually a difficult problem to solve without replacing the stairway. So let's go ahead and lower our riser height by simply adding a riser at the landing. And by doing this, you will not need to go any further into the existing building which means you won't have to modify the floor framing or the wall framing, and in some cases, your basement or your roof framing. And for those of you wondering, why would you be modifying the roof framing? That might be to allow for more headroom for the stairway. Yes, this is not an easy problem to fix once you get outside of the original measurements for the stairwell. And let's go ahead and wrap this video up with something that the stairway might look like in your house after you're done. I know it gets a little confusing when I have a box here sitting on top of another box connecting to the stairs and you can't see the wood framing on it. Now this was not meant to provide you with framing details, just simply design suggestions. I do have a book at our website on how to build stairs with landings that should provide you with all the information you need to rebuild your stairway to lower the riser height if that's going to allow you to create a safer stairway to use. Here's a video for those of you wondering why we might need more ADA approved ramps. And of course one of those reasons will be to make wheelchair access a little easier and to eliminate a situation where it might take two people to actually get one person down the ramp. And I would imagine the same situation would appear here because this seems to be a little steeper than you might find in the United States, where the maximum slope for a ramp is usually going to be one inch vertically for every 12 inches horizontally. And even though something like this might look appropriate, it's even a little too steep where something like this might not be. And it actually looks like it has some type of grooves cut into the concrete to provide a little better traction for people using wheelchairs or walkers trying to get from point A to point B. And of course, a special note to those builders who complain about the additional cost of building these ramps would be to point out that even though you might have this much energy today, you might not have that same energy when you get a little older. Here's an excellent way to build a set of stairs that might not meet your local building codes, yet get the job done. And in the video, I'm not going to be providing you with all of the information you need to build something like this, because let's face it, how many people have a saw that will cut one of these giant logs in half? So let's go ahead and get started with a couple of the pieces. I would imagine you can cut them into whatever size you need. And in our example, our sections of the logs are 10 inches thick. And since the sections of the logs might not be the same size in width, then you might need to space them a little further apart. I don't recommend spacing them too far apart. And by that, two inches apart might be maximum. And that's only if you have to do it. I would rather see them right up against each other, nice and tight like this. Or if you need to, you could even cut a section of the log. You could actually cut the back and the front if needed. For example, if I figured out the depth of the tread that I needed, and it was 20 inches, but the diameter of the log was 30 inches, then it might be better to take 5 inches off the back and 5 inches off the front. 
to provide your feet with a little more support at the front of the step. And for those of you who need more information on calculating the individual riser height and the tread depth, I will have more information on that in the second part of the video. Next up in the video, I'm going to go ahead and remove the top step in our example because you can see where this one here is almost level with the upper floor. And we're just simply measuring from the back of the step to the front of the lower step. And you can actually calculate the rise on something like this by installing a step at the bottom and a step at the top and then using the information in the second half of the video to calculate the measurements you need to build a more accurate stairway. And I say accurate stairway. However, you can create a hodgepodge of steps, something like this, or a straight stairway, or even a longer curved stairway if needed, by simply starting with one of your sections of the log at the top or the bottom, and then installing the next step and then the next one in whatever pattern you decide. And then if you get to the top and it's either too tall or too short, then you can always measure the difference of each step as long as they're level and then add all of these measurements up to calculate the total rise that you need and then divide that into the number of risers that you have and that will provide you with a total rise. Then you will divide the number of individual risers into the total rise number and then you can use that measurement to make each one of the steps the same height by either raising the ones that you need raised or lowering the ones that need to be lowered. And again, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail in this because these stairways will not meet most local building codes. However, it might be a lot better than just trying to navigate your way up or down the side of a hill without them. Let's go ahead and take a look at a project that you might be wondering about as prices for lumber increases, and that's whether or not you can eliminate a center stringer or even more than one center stringers, especially on wider stairways. Now the first thing I want to point out about a two stringer stairway is that you might need larger lumber, and this would include the stair stringers, the risers, and the treads. And if that's the case, you might consider using an unnotched stair stringer with brackets or even slots cut in for the stair treads to slide into. And I do have books about both types of stairway assembly at our website. So the assembly for something like this isn't too difficult. You're going to fasten everything together the same way, except you're going to be using nails or screws to connect the bottom of the riser to the back of the tread. This is going to prevent the tread from moving and quite possibly could allow you to use smaller lumber there. Keep in mind that they have been building stairs with three quarter inch lumber for centuries now with this method and stair stringers spaced between 24 and 36 inches apart. And in my opinion, I like the tried and true method, so I'm going to choose this one here as the winner because I have seen them use successfully over time with very few problems. Now, the one that I mentioned about the three quarter inch thick solid lumber treads and risers might not always fall into that category. Well, we've all heard it before that old growth lumber is better than the new lumber that we're using today. So I thought I would go ahead and do all of my viewers a favor and try to figure out what the compressive strength is for the old growth, what it is for the new growth, and what's actually required by the engineers who created the span charts for rafters and floor framing. And according to them, the minimum compression PSI rating for a 16 foot long floor joist is going to be 237 PSI. And for a longer floor joist, like a 24 foot long floor joist, it's going to be 356 PSI. So the minimum compression rating will vary depending upon the length of the lumber. And now that we got that out of the way, let's go ahead and throw out some more numbers. The new growth number, according to one survey that was done by a university, suggested that old growth Douglas fir, they did not give the age of the lumber or where it was cut down or all this other stuff that probably makes a big difference also, was tested with a 567 PSI rating. The new lumber 
at a 464 PSI rating. And if the minimum I need for a 24 foot floor joist is only 356 PSI, then I don't think it's really going to make that big of a difference whether I use old growth or new growth lumber. Now keep in mind that I've seen a lot of things over the years and one of those is when someone else is trying to push someone else's agenda and make you believe something that might not be a big deal in the first place. So until these new homes start falling down because of the compression strength of the joist and the roof rafters, then I won't worry about using old Douglas fir lumber or reclaiming used lumber from an old house. And it's often harder to cut. And I can't tell you how many times you're going to split that lumber when you go to drive a toenail into it. And maybe that is because the compression strength is higher on the older lumber. Here is another question from one of our viewers who was wondering why they build certain types of winder stairways with extremely small steps. And that would be something like this or this. And it's usually going to be built in another country, not in the United States, where you might find something like this or this right here. This one here provides us with the most updated building codes that requires a six inch minimum distance on the inside and a minimum distance for a walk line. And I do have other videos on that at our website in the building code area. And I'll try to put a link to that in the video description box. And you would need to check with your local building department as to whether you would need to use this one or this one here. And each one of the stairways in the design has a minimum width of 36 inches. And the same would be for the stairways over here. And of course, the amount of floor space or square footage in your home or building that this stairway, this stairway, and this one would take up. And I'm not about to suggest that the main reason why they build a stairway like this is for the room or the space. Because I've seen stairways like this one here in castles in extremely large buildings. So let's go ahead and take a look at how much space we're actually going to have to place our foot on the step with this type of winder stairway. And if you can't read it right here, this is five and seven eighths of an inch in the center of the stairway. And I'm not about to suggest you can't move over and walk up the outside of the stairway. Because I can almost guarantee you're not going to be walking up on the inside of the stairway like you could do with the ones that have a little more room. So again, you can always walk up the outside perimeter of the stairway. And I would imagine that's what most people are going to do with either one of these stairways here. And in this one here, we have a seven and seven sixteenths of an inch step. So about an inch and a half wider in depth than the one before. And for those of you who have larger feet or don't pay attention while you're walking up and down the stairway as much as you should, then you might need to go with one of these two stairways. And I would imagine if you had a grippable handrail going up around the perimeter of this stairway, that you shouldn't have a problem with this step. And everybody walks along the exterior perimeter of the stairway, then you're probably not going to have a problem. But that's not the case. I actually built a winder stairway like this in a house that I owned, where there was five occupants of the house, and everybody in the house fell down the stairs at least once right here because you're not walking on the outside. You're taking the shortest path possible when you're walking up and down the stairways. Now I do have to say this, and that's the fact that everybody who fell down the stairway was coming down the stairway. They were not going up the stairs, which leads us to the main reason why we have this building code here, because people aren't always going to be paying attention. And they're also going to be carrying large objects up and down the stairway or even wearing socks while walking up and down a stairway with a smooth wood or marble finish. And I think the moral to this story, from my point of view anyway, is that you're not always going to be able to sacrifice square footage. You might need to increase the size of your stairway to prevent or even eliminate possible injuries that could happen to people who just might not be paying attention while walking up and down a set of stairs with extremely small steps. 
Here is another thing you need to be aware of when installing a set of stairs or a landing outside of an entry door into a building that you would like to keep water out of, and that will be to keep the landing lower than the height of the floor inside. And this is standard construction. I see it all the time. You rarely see the landing at the same height or higher. And this example should provide you with the reason why. Any water that hits the top of the landing or the top of the stair step should safely drain away and not enter into the building. However, that might not be the case if the landing is at the same level or higher than the floor inside of the building. And I'm not about to suggest you can't have a situation like this where you can't somehow create a watertight threshold. However, I don't think that's going to be the case if the landing is higher. And there are going to be some building code requirements, especially for the American Disabilities Act, that could require the landing to be the same height or a quarter of an inch lower, which won't be providing you with much protection for any water pooling up on the landing that could quite possibly enter into the house through a small gap or crack underneath or above the door threshold. And thanks for watching. Also, don't forget to visit our website. We have an organized list of our videos there. You might have a difficult time finding that anywhere else.